Hello, I'm David Coffey. I want to turn to God's word to Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. And I want to talk from God's word about how to survive the storms of life. These storms can come so suddenly into our lives. The storms of natural disaster, the storms of war and bloodshed, the storms of financial hardship, the storm of concerns about health and bereavement, the storms of family concern. I guess most of us are experienced sailors when it comes to the storms of life on the great oceans. And in our vulnerable little vessels, we often limp into the harbour with our broken masts of tragedy and our torn sails of disappointment and our missing rudders of uh, anxiety. Is there anything God can say to us from his word that will help us to survive the storms? Well, let's look at this story of Jesus and his disciples when they were experiencing a storm. What does it teach us? The first thing is when the storms of life come, we need to know that Jesus is praying for us. The Bible passage tells us that this had been an exhausting day for Jesus and the disciples. There had been the feeding of the 5,000, but the chapter had opened with the terrible news that the cousin of Jesus, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. So that they were bereaved and uh, still getting over the feeding of the 5,000 and all that had happened there with 5,000 people being fed from one boy's lunch. Jesus knew these disciples were tired and weary. So he says to them, you get into the boat, go to the other side where I will meet you, and I will dismiss the crowds. Well, he dismisses the crowds and then goes up on the mountain to pray. And Matthew says that the disciples set sail and are caught in a violent storm. Why would Matthew include these particular details in his gospel? The disciples caught in the storm, Jesus on a mountain praying. Because at the time Matthew was writing, the early church was experiencing a great storm of persecution. Stephen had been martyred. Believers had been scattered. They were running for safety. Businesses were closed and houses had, had, be, had been left behind. Families were divided. Believers were missing the presence of Jesus. And during this time, some of these early disciples would say, does Jesus know what's happening to us? Where is he? Does he care about all that we're experiencing? And so through the apostles grew up the body of uh, um, teaching about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is now reigning, they would say. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father on high. Look at the number of times in the early chapters of the Acts of the Apostles where that vision is given, that when Stephen died, he saw the risen and reigning Lord Jesus. But Jesus is not only risen and reigning, he is also the one who rules. He rules his church. He is head of the church and Lord of all. And through his obedient disciples, he exercises his kingly rule in this world. He's not only reigning and ruling, he's waiting. He is the one who is waiting to return as the true king of the universe. But perhaps the most helpful truth that is put down in the scriptures for us is this. When the storms of life arise, Jesus is praying. He is the great high priest. He is the friend in high places who is deeply concerned for us. And he knows how to pray for us. Do you remember how he prayed for Peter? He prayed for Peter. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. The way Jesus prays for us is customized prayer. So be assured, my friend, when the storms of life arise, Jesus is praying. And we, we need to respond to that invitation of God's word. You'll find it in Hebrews 4, 16. Draw near with boldness to the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. The second thing from the passage is when the storms of life arise, in the eye of the storm, Jesus is Lord. Now, these disciples were experienced fishermen. They, they were not frightened by sudden storms. When the Bible says here they were terrified, it doesn't mean to say they were terrified by the wind and the waves. What terrified them was the ghostly figure of Jesus walking on the waves towards them. They didn't realize it was their friend. 
It took Jesus to call out and say to them, it's me, take courage, don't be afraid. Now here's a question. Why would Pastor Jesus, who just a few verses previously had shown his pastoral concern for these disciples, you get into the boat, I'll dismiss the crowds, why should he now alarm them with this ghostly uh, apparition figure? I'll tell you why. Because in every situation, Jesus, through the Gospels, demonstrates he is Lord. The Son of God demonstrates his divine power in every situation. That's why we see in the Gospel stories how Jesus enters the world of hunger and disease and death, worlds where people felt helpless and hopeless, and Jesus transforms those worlds with his divine power and presence. He enters the world of hunger, and he says, I am the Lord who provides, and 5,000 hungry people are fed. He enters the world of disease, says, I am the Lord who heals, and the blind see, and the lame walk, and, and the lepers are cleansed. He enters the world of death. He comes to broken-hearted families and says, I am the resurrection and the life, and the dead are raised, and they are restored to their families. Jesus is the one who even walks to his death on Calvary. He's nailed to a tree and laid in a tomb, and the third day God raises him from the dead. Listen to what the Lord says. The Lord says, I have the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to take it up again. In every situation, this is our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why he walks on the waves. He is the master of every storm that we face and he's in control of the situation that you face right now. I want you to see Jesus, our master and commander, walking to us on the waves and the storm that you're facing. He comes as the mighty God and the wonderful counsellor, the everlasting father and the prince of peace. At the height of the storm, in verses 28 and 29, here's a most interesting part of this passage. At the height of the storm, Jesus calls us to do the impossible. Uh, we read in this passage how Peter, at the height of the storm, uh, says, Jesus, if it's you, bid me come and walk on the water. Jesus says, come. Peter gets out of the boat and walks on the water. You see, humanly speaking, you would imagine that in the eye of the storm, you stay in the boat. What's the sense in getting out of the boat until you're in the safety of the harbour? The other disciples must have said to Peter, in the words of the song we know, not that they knew it, sit down, you're rocking the boat. They must have been alarmed when Peter began to get out of the boat. But you see, here's the divine wisdom. That when the storms of life arise, when we simply want the storm to pass, get me to the safety of the harbour is our prayer. In spiritual terms, we need to realise that God sometimes chooses to launch a new initiative in the eye of the storm. Peter's the first to grasp that this ghostly figure is Jesus. And he gets out of the boat and walks on water. You know, there are two things you can ask at this moment. You can actually say, well, how did Peter do that? And does it happen today? Or you can ask what I think is the more profound question. Where does this action of Peter fit into all that the Bible speaks about faith in the life of the disciple? I think faith is getting involved in things over which we don't have any control, especially the outcomes. And God does do that. He does face us with impossible tasks. He asks us to attempt things for him, the outcomes of which are beyond our control. You see, we like to manage our lives like a business. We like to budget and calculate and plan and organize. And that, my friend, is not the life of faith. The life of faith is doing something for God where you can't control the outcomes. This is what Peter does. He's trusting God for something where he cannot see the end result. So remember, in that terrible storm you may be experiencing at the moment, it's just possible that God may challenge you in the eye of the storm to do something impossible for him. Here's a further thing in verses 30 and 31. In the eye of the storm, Jesus saves. 
Well, we need this comforting word, don't we? Peter has done the impossible. He, with his eyes on Jesus, gets out of the boat and begins to walk towards Jesus. And then suddenly he gets his eyes on the wind and the waves. Eyes off Jesus, eyes on the circumstance. It's a very important principle of storm management. That the faith that has said yes to Jesus, it gets you out of the boat to do the impossible, has to remain the faith that stays focused on Jesus. If you're going to do something impossible for God, you need faith to say yes, and you need faith to complete the task. How many times in my life and in yours has there been when I say, I'm in this storm because I've been obedient to Jesus? I haven't done anything wrong or sinful. I'm sinking under a burden of responsibility God has given me to do. We're in a storm because we've been obedient to his word. I like what Peter does. It doesn't say when he's going down for the third time, he says, help. The moment he feels himself sinking, he says, Jesus, save me. Jesus reaches out. There has to be a word of rebuke to the disciple. There can be no discipleship with Jesus without there being correction from the master. But when you're sinking in a storm, when you feel that the burden of responsibility that you've taken on is greater than you can bear, then you cry out to Jesus right now. You say, Jesus, save me. I have a friend who works in a refugee camp in Africa. He leads uh, a gifted team. He's a very gifted leader himself. The camp was set up during the days of a a very bloody uh, civil war. Thousands had been murdered. There were widows and orphans and homeless people, hungry people. Many people entering the camp had blood on their hands and anger in their hearts. They were all crowding on a daily basis into this camp. It was a place teeming with human need. A friend told me how one day he got up and looked out over all this human need and said, Lord, I can't go on serving you here. And he heard the Lord saying to him this, I'm not asking you to do everything, but I am asking you to do something. I'm asking you to do something significant for me and my kingdom. God doesn't ask us to be the saviour of the world. But he does ask us to get involved in doing things which are significant. Remember, Jesus is the one who says, I am able to keep you from falling. We might say in the context of this passage, I am the able, the one who is able to save you from sinking in service. And the final picture is when the storm is over, faith is always stronger. The final picture is Peter is back in the boat. The disciples are worshipping And my personal testimony is this, faith is always stronger after the storm. I've met hundreds of believers around the world who have the same testimony. In the words of Isaiah 42, and maybe this is your testimony as well, when we pass through the waters, we did not drown. And when we walk through the fire, the flames did not consume us. In the eye of the storm, stay close to Jesus, and you too will have a testimony to God's goodness. God bless you.